right, we're back in the Zoom Zoom room. Conversations with the culture, the athlete I have from overseas right now. Don't know where this guy is, but we're going to ask him. Uh, I have Emil Bergevin. I said that right, right? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, right. okay, European soccer player. And I want to make sure I get this one right, too, when I'm uh, shouting out your club and organization. Uh, FC Twente. Twente, yes. Twente, again, Twente. Perfect. And yeah. that's, in, that's in the Netherlands, right? Yes, correct. Uh, we are up in the Nether Netherlands, located in a city that's even harder to pronounce, so we'll skip that part. You can't pronounce it and you live there? <laughs> no, I can't do it. Well, I can try, but uh, it's not, we don't have to. Eh? <laughs> and, and you're not from there. Your, your citizenship is with Denmark and uh, Croatia, right? Yes, that's correct. I'm half Danish, half Croatian, okay. but I grew up in Denmark, and then I, I have spent most of my professional career playing in Germany. And now I have been in Holland for a year. All right, so take us through this journey. I want to start off with the journey because obviously, you know, I love talking about athletes brands off the pitch or off the field, you know, but kind of introduce us to that journey because American people or sports fans, we don't know what that journey is like for no. European uh, soccer players or footballers uh, uh, outside of America. So kind of take us through that journey. Yeah, definitely. So soccer is, we call it football, you know that, but yeah. I'll call it soccer today. It's obviously the, the number one sport in Europe and in Denmark too. So that's what every boy dreams of, uh, of, of playing professionally when he yeah. grows up. Uh, and of course, like uh, anyone else uh, around where I grew up, I had that dream. Um, so I, I guess I was around four or five years old before I started playing uh, in a club. Wow. And um, and then just through the whole um, the whole uh, my, my my school time, I, I played a lot of football. And when I was um, I don't know, maybe ten, twelve, you could see I was one of the better better players. And then slowly, some some started uh, excelling, and other players uh, stopped and found other interests. But uh, I became uh, semi-professional at the age of fifteen in a good uh, Danish environment, yeah. And uh, from there, it, it became a little a, a tack more complicated because when I was uh, 16, I also had to um, go to the next level with my education. So I started, um, like, we have a system that we call, like, gymnasium. I, I guess it's like your high school, yeah. where you had... Uh, I had more advanced uh, studies and subjects for three years where I also had to put a lot of energy in that. And we don't combine our schooling system with our sports. So you have to go to school and afterwards you have to do your sport. And that was uh, kind of a double, uh, I, it took a lot of effort in those years. Uh, and after I finished school, when I was 18, 19, I became a full-time professional and after uh, one or two seasons in the in the Danish leagues, I I made a transfer. Uh, I broke through and uh, made a name for myself in Denmark. And then through some performances with the under twenty one national team, I earned a transfer to Germany, wow. uh, which is um, a very good step for a young player. And uh, from there, my career really uh, started. Wow, man! So I mean, uh, that's that's it's different from what we're used to here, you know? Like even, I feel kind of detached, or I used to feel detached from the rest of the world or your everyday problems that people go through because playing high school football, playing college football, we're kind of away from everybody, you know? And in professional football, we live our kind of bubbled lives. So do you feel like just, you know, since you've been, you've been doing this since four or five years old, you've been involved with the club, you know, you've, you've been uh, growing in this sport for, for, for quite some time. Do you feel like a little detached from like your everyday person, you know, sometimes? Yeah, I, I, I definitely feel sometimes I'm, I'm living uh, in another world than the rest of the society uh, yep. because my, my everyday life is so different and has been for so many years. Um, but I think growing up while going to, to school where the sports are not involved in the school system at all, yeah, uh, makes it a bit more normal in that sense. Uh, so I wasn't the star of my school, for example, because I they know uh, they knew who I was because I played soccer, but I didn't play for the school, you know. So yeah, I was yeah. uh, uh, a school hero like that. I would have maybe liked to be that. <laughs> yeah. 
That's crazy, man. Uh, it's just so, like I said, we're not we're not used to that here. And um, I mean, you've been to you've been to America before. I've never I didn't get that chance to link with you when you spent uh, that off season in L.A. Uh, that time. So how different is playing soccer in Europe and all across the world than it is here in in America? Like, how is is soccer and football viewed differently? Different towards uh, soccer in in America or other yeah. sports? Yeah, uh, but I mean we can say both. You know, we can say yeah, all right. soccer and football. Yeah, I mean fo- football, basketball, any sport. Yeah, oh, I love your American sports over there. As well. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I'm really impressed with in America is that um, you have such you you really have respect for athletes. Yeah, and I feel like, for example. Uh, on the area of sports science, you are just uh, years ahead of us in Europe uh, because it's a it's a private business like uh, rehab centers and uh, sports medicine. It's it's just a whole business where people compete to be better than each other. And for me, uh, going and training in I trained in Philadelphia, and later on I did my uh, my off season in LA. And uh, the level of um, of training, I, I got there at training and treatment. It did a lot for my body. So I think yeah. that uh, I hold that in high regard because I think in Europe, it's more like when there is a new way of doing things, we need to test it and test it and test it. And then when we know now we will, we can say for sure it's science, then we implement it. Where I feel like in your private sector, if some something works, you just go with it. And yeah. that's how you move, uh, move faster than us. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in soccer, if I should mention something about the difference, we, we don't have uh, any, uh, any data about a 40 meter dash, for example, or a vertical jump or a broad jump, like that or like that on, on, on the soccer players is limited okay. to how much ground do you cover during a game and during practice, but not like how, how far can you jump? How, how, what is your vertical jump and how fast are you actually? So you guys don't do combines and you don't do height weight, well, height weight measurements, but like you say, you don't test the 40s, the broad jumps, the, the high jumps. So when, when a soccer club or organization is, shows interest in you, how do they evaluate you? They just watch you play. Yeah, definitely. Wow. They, that is they, they don't, the physical <laughs> aspect, they, they will watch your videos and they will determine through that. But uh, the technical and tactical aspects of soccer is by far the most important ones. But the physical importance is, is growing as well in our sport. It, it's going, you need to be fast, you need to be strong. But if you see the average soccer player, he, he's not that tall, you know. Yes, yeah. Uh, and he yeah. can run a lot, but he's not as uh, explosive as an NFL player at all. Yeah, I, see, the height weight thing, because, I mean, if you think about it, the NBA, to play in the NBA, I mean, let's be honest, you kind of got to be over, what, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, I mean, they've yeah. had Muggsy Bowles, the Nate Robinsons, but those guys are anomalies, you know, they're, they're freaks. Um, in the NFL, to play NFL football, you kind of have, depending on what position, you kind of have to be, you know, how big are you, how fast are you, how strong are you, uh, that sort of thing. But, but like you're saying, in soccer, it's just, hey, you can play going out there. Because like he's Messi's like 5'5". Five, five. Like you, you're <laughs> one of the six, four, So the heights can, can, can range when it comes to that. Uh, since we're still on uh, corona, the, the coronavirus, we're all in lockdown right now. I wanted to kind of talk about how – you've been able to stay in shape, what type of things you're doing to prepare. And also, you know, I want to talk about how other players, you know, like players in the Premier League, how they rejected that offer to uh, take a pay cut and they put it on the owners. Um, So coronavirus is affecting all of us worldwide. So first, let's start off with how you've been staying in shape. What type of training have you been able to do? And what are you hearing from soccer officials in terms of a resume in play or if you'll have to wait till next year, next season. Yeah, so uh, all the all the countries and leagues in Europe, they have their own way of doing it, of, of dealing with this situation. Yep. Uh, but all of them has paused at least. Mm-hmm. Only the Belgium uh, league has said we cancel the league already. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Holland, where I'm at, we are uh, paused until further notice. But it will at least uh, take uh, until uh, mid-May or something. So, yeah, yeah I think the initial phase, um, 
all players got a running program they had to d deal with at home. And um, I was lucky enough to have the chance to keep training at the club, just one-on-one -on -one training sessions on the pitch with one coach. Mm -hmm. And that really uh, has helped me because uh, otherwise I, uh, I, I would have a really boring life. Yeah. So that's, uh, of course, the highlight of my day. Yeah. So I think um, now when they know the league is not going to continue for a while, most players have some holidays. So they got to deal with their freedom and still keep fit. Mm. Yeah, man, that's, we're, we're all bored, man. We're all struggling with this boredom. And I haven't worked out in what feels like forever. So kudos to you for getting out there and, uh, you know, staying in shape. And, and uh, you know, to talk about the Premier League, you know, I, I kind of mentioned how the players uh, rejected the pay cut. I want to mm. ask you, do you feel as though, or what do you feel is the responsibility of the player and the organization when it comes to these pay cuts and being able to help out uh, others in need? Yeah, well, it's a good question. I, uh, I followed the, the situation in the Premier League uh, with half an eye, I would say. And um, I heard the players' arguments were that um, they would also, they are already paying a lot of tax and, uh, taxes and the, NH, uh, the NHS, the healthcare system in England, would miss out on a lot of income if they just drop their wages and actually it would benefit the owners. Mm. So I see their point of view. Um, the clubs have a lot of money in England. So I think, um, um, of course, there will be some kind of pressure from the public for the clubs to help out, but also they are losing money. So I'm not in a position to, to, uh, to comment on that, I think. Yeah. But from the player's point of view, you know, everyone thinks that the players should be able to help out but if you if you sign a binding contract then you you plan your your finances uh, yeah. um, on account of that contract and maybe you 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 um, you do some investment on and, and pay on a monthly basis and you have to reorganize everything if you have to take a pay cut so i i do understand that it's not as easy yeah and uh wayne rooney well, i mean wayne rooney wrote a piece in the times uk where he said that players have no problem taking money and donating it to a cause that they know and they feel is, is worthy of, you know, of the money. But they were saying that he was saying in it that he doesn't, or some players don't feel comfortable just giving the money back to the owners, taking that pay cut, putting them, keeping the money in the owner's pocket, where they don't know where their money is going to go which mm. charity or is it going to health services or who it's going to. So mm. he and some of the other players uh, started what's called players together to where uh, that money is going to the health services of England. Mm. And, and uh, so that's Wayne Rooney though, you know, usually mm. when it comes to an athlete or someone speaking out against something, when it's going against an organization or even some sort of social injustice, that's not the, the case in this cause. It has to be a LeBron James. It has to be a Steph Curry. It has to be a Wayne Rooney because those guys are those guys. Their names are big. Their names mm -hmm. are huge. So it's you know I, I read I was reading online where people are like oh more more players should, should speak up more players you know players should boycott they should do that but not every player is in the position like a Wayne Rooney or a LeBron mm -hmm. James to really speak up because if you get cut then there's yeah. no money coming in you know. Oh, yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. It's it's easier for Wayne Rooney to take a pay cut than it is for uh, a young, hopeful Af African yeah. player who is uh, financing half his family in Africa, maybe. Yeah. So it's it's not the same for everyone. Yeah. Um, I want to talk, let's go into brands. Um, because when we think about brands, you know, LeBron James with Nike, Michael Jordan with Nike, you know, Kobe Bryant and Adidas, um, Messi and Adidas. We athletes are always teaming up with other brands for endorsements. Mm -hmm. You, you yourself in your career, what endorsements have you had? And when it comes to picking uh, a company to, to endorse with or collab with, and when it comes to your brand, what are some of the things you're thinking about in your head when it comes to that collaboration? Uh, yeah, well, I I was with Adidas for a while, and uh, now I'm I'm a free agent. Um, but um, 
sometimes there will pop up some options in my in my dms from some company that would like a little collaboration yeah. and the only thing i think of is it is this uh, does this go well with who i am as a footballer and who i want to be so i would probably not um let's say i would not uh, uh make a, a commercial with something inappropriate and i <laughs> and that's uh, that's the only thing i uh, i, I want to say about that. but who are you as a football player and as a brand like what if you were to define your brand how yeah. how, how would you define that it's a really good question um because i, I, uh, I, I get paid to do this man i get paid yeah to do this, man. I, <laughs> I, I think not all of us have thought that one through yeah. Uh, I definitely always had an idea that I wanted to be uh, in every interview. I wanted to be interactive with the fans. I wanted, sh I wanted to share something about myself. And <laughs> really, this honesty that I came in with and still brings to the table sometimes, it just backfires um, with, uh, really? with, with a twisted headline here and there. So I, I do find it difficult to be exactly the brand i want to be in that sense um but yeah if i if i should tell you what kind of brand i am i am i am a physical striker who is um who loves to score goals this is always what i want to try and uh, and turn this the conversation into yeah. if i'm uh, in some kind of interview and uh, i'm very ambitious and i'm not afraid to share my ambitions uh, publicly and I get beaten for that sometimes, especially if you have been out injured and you come back and you still believe in yourself. This is not the norm and it's not always welcome where I'm from. Um, I think it's more uh, usual around uh, in America. So um, this, is, uh, this is my brand there. And when you talk about off the field and you, you know, you're describing your brand off the field, since you are spoken out, when it comes to your on the field and believe in yourself, does that kind of cross over into your off the field life when it comes to collaborating with uh, different brands and commercials and speaking engagements, that sort of thing? Uh, well, it could, but I think in, in, in the world of soccer, then I'm a couple of years in Germany, now I'm in Holland, I don't know where I'm going to be. And yeah. most of my time, I, I just concentrate on playing my sport at the moment. So I think um the the openness i'm showing and the the character I'm, I'm i'm trying to show in interviews and off the off the pitch it will probably benefit me more after my career like okay. maybe uh like you had a great you have a great second career going after your um your nfl career so um i think I, i'm thinking of it in that sense because right now my focus is on the field and you think it's your do you, do you think that that should should be the mentality of players like you and me who weren't Wayne, Wayne Rudy's in terms of you know superstars, mega brands? You think that they should just focus on their on the field and then worry about all that after they play, or do you think it's something that you should be thinking about and possibly getting kicked off while you're playing? Well, I always have a hard time if I see some player who is struggling and, and not performing and he's doing a lot of other stuff than actually playing and training, you know, where I'm like, where your, your focus should be at your career. Yeah. So um, you can't say nothing if, if, you're, if, if it's an athlete who's just competing and performing all the time, then he can, he can do whatever he likes in his, his, in his free his spare time and he can... Ronaldo. Christian the brand exactly. he can fly and watch a boxing game at, yeah. at the other side of the globe of the other side of the Atlantic if he wants to if he keeps performing but the, the moment you don't perform you have to concentrate on your game yeah yeah I it's it's funny you say that because I've been one of those players before who were tweeting and uh, you know when I played in the Canadian Football League I had this one season where it was just it was terrible. You know, I was coming off a knee injury, I was getting concussions, wasn't playing well, dropping a couple of balls. But I'd be on social media, I'd be out at this event, you know, I'd be out at that event. I was taking acting classes at that time, and you could feel some of the not so much negativity from other players in the locker room, but it was just one of those things of accountability where it's like, hey, we're not 
you're not here or we're not all the way up here in Canada for you to be doing modeling stuff, taking pictures. We're here for you to catch that ball so we can win that game. So, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's something that we as athletes, it's a balance, you know, because we only get that 15 minutes of fame while playing, and it's like you got to strike it while, while, while the iron's hot. So yeah. when, when it comes to our MLS, our, our, our uh, professional league over here, what are, what's the thought process from the European players when it comes to our MLS? We've had Drogba, we've had Zoltan Ibrahimovic, we've had Wayne Rooney, David Beckham. Those guys come over here. Is it one of those things where it's like, all right, I'm retired, I'm just going to play a couple more years in the MLS? Or do you feel as though you can really enhance your brand by coming over here to America and playing in front of American eyes. Well, it's 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 growing in interest for sure. So really, yeah, many players that I play with or speak with, or my, some of my friends who play in other leagues, um, they they would already now talk about that they want to play in the MLS someday. But I feel that this someday has moved a bit to maybe a day that's not all the way in the in towards the end of your career but maybe okay. a day uh, maybe towards the middle of your career okay. so most players know okay you have uh, some designated players and some players can earn very good money over there mm -hmm. but you just have a few so you have if you if you go while you're at your best you you probably have a shot of getting a good contract and that's also a big part of it for most players in Europe because sports wise it's still more beneficial for you to play in Europe but if you go over there in a good age and you perform um, recent years has shown that some some players even take the step from MLS and back to the Premier League or from the from Mexico to MLS and from there to Premier League so it's not a retirement league it's not like that anymore I don't think and I think most players um, that I know they are interested in the league and want to go there one day wow Wow, man, we would love to have you all over here. I mean, uh, I went to a Colorado Rapids game uh, last year, and I, it was Rap Rapids versus – it was the exhibition Rapids versus Arsenal. And the stadium, I mean, it was, it was, it was packed, and people couldn't wait to see uh, – what's his name? Uh, Mario Goats. Goats. Mario Goats. Does he play for uh, – For Arsenal. He doesn't play for Arsenal. What's the guy named the, – the German guy that plays for Arsenal? He's really good. Mr. Uh, Dursil. <laughs> Maybe yeah, Ursula. Ursula. yeah, yeah, yeah. Him and then Obama Yang. Like I saw those are the jerseys I saw all over the place. I'm a Chelsea guy, so I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. But just just that overall, uh, just that overall atmosphere, man. I absolutely, yeah. absolutely love it. And I kind of I want to go back a little bit to the point where you're talking about how when you were signed with uh, Adidas, while you know you're playing in country, going from country to country, playing in different leagues. Has there ever been some sort of conflict? with your brand, two brands that you've been attached with, you know, like one, because one could be a global and one could be more, uh, more of a, a national brand. Has there ever been some sort of conflict when it came to signing and working and collabing with uh, other brands? No, it has never been that big of a focus for me. Okay. So, you know, I, uh, when I was at my best, um, I chose not to sign with Adidas because I thought, okay, if I make another step, it might be really good for me endorsement wise. And uh, yeah, since then, uh, and, uh, not a lot has come up. So I'm good with that because I'm. Uh, hey, hey, gotta, gotta do what we gotta do. First, we gotta get back on the pitch, man. I'm missing my, I'm missing my football in the morning. Yeah. American football and, and regular football. Yeah. But I have to. I just have to comment on what you said about the MLS because I I noticed that I think it was Nashville or something like that. A new franchise opened up, and the first game, boom, sixty thousand spectators. Yeah. That's yeah. just amazing. Yeah, I mean, you guys. I remember when uh, you guys you gave me and uh, Brandon Carrier, my boy, tickets to the uh, what was it, Mike's versus Shaka, and yeah. uh, we went we went to your apartment, picked up the tickets, and uh, you gave me that jersey. I still got that jersey, bro. Appreciate yeah. that. And uh, you guys, Mites, at the time, wasn't, you guys were like towards the bottom of the Bundesliga, but Schalke was second at yeah. that time. And I mean, Opa Arena, Oppo Arena, was, it was packed and Schalke yeah. scored and you see people lighting flares and all. I'm like, this, 
this is this is environment right here. There is a lot of energy in German football. The passion yeah. is uh, second to none, I think. And you're starting to see that trickle down, trickle over in the MLS. Um, like I said, uh, I'm part of a, a group, a fan group here called uh, CFC Rockies, and we're huge Chelsea fans. And, you know, we meet up at the bar at like 5 a.m. in the morning, and we're watching Chelsea games, and we're drunk 5 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> jumping around, singing the chants. So you That's can awesome. see it. It's coming, it's coming over here. That way, that yeah. energy is really, it's making its way over here. And uh, right. I, it's only a matter of time. Uh, man, tell the people where they can find you, my man, on social media. And uh, what, what type of stuff you got coming up next? Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not that uh, good on Twitter, so uh, Instagram <laughs> is where you find me. Uh, my Instagram is just my name, Emil Berggren, and uh, that's where you can follow and see a little bit of what I'm doing yeah. outside the pitch also, yeah. And when you uh, spell his name, it's two G's, two E's at Berggren. Burgery. It took me forever on Google to realize that, but I kept putting it in one G. And man, I thank you, man. I hope our viewers and the people who are watching and listening to this really learned something because not only is European soccer uh, still kind of a question mark when it comes to Americans, but just thanks for giving us an uh, inside to, you know, your, your, your come up, you know, your, your life, your journey, your brand, man. We really yeah. Appreciate it. No problem, Brandon. All right, my man. Take it easy. Yeah, take care, brother.